to Orientanian, young and lovely, the girl from Ipanema goes walking in. It is backtracks time once again. So I don't know where the months are going uh, this year so far, but it's just it's, they've just been flying by. Uh, yes, it is my monthly roundup of notable album anniversaries, divisible by five, as well as a spotlight album or two. So let's just jump right into the festivities and see which albums are celebrating anniversaries this March of 2019. Sixty years ago, Chet Baker released his album Chet. He was accompanied by the rhythm section of bassist Paul Chambers, pianist Bill Evans, and drummer Philly Joe Jones, who were best known at the time for their work with trumpeter Miles Davis, as well as flautist Herbie Mann, saxophonist Pepper Adams, and guitarist Kenny Burrell. The album is entirely instrumental, although Baker was known by that time as much for his singing as for his trumpet playing. The album's tracks include Cole Porter's You'd Be So Nice to Come Home To, Rogers and Hart's It Never Entered My Mind, as well as the classics You and the Night and the Music and How High the Moon. Also released in March of 1959 was Richie Valens' self-titled debut album. It peaked at number 23 on the Billboard Albums chart and featured his hit songs La Bamba, which was a rearrangement of a traditional Mexican folk song, and which Rolling Stone ranked at number 345 on their list of the 500 greatest songs of all time, and Donna his highest charting song at number two on the Billboard Hot 100, as well as Come On, Let's Go and Ooh My Head. The album was released one month after The Day the Music Died, the Iowa plane crash that also claimed the lives of Buddy Holly and J.P. Richardson, also known as the Big Bopper, and would have also killed Waylon Jennings had he not traded places with Richardson. At just 17 years old, Valens was the youngest victim of the crash. Fifty-five years ago this month, Sam Cooke released Ain't That Good News, his thirteenth and final album before his death nine months later. It gets cheerier after this, trust me. Uh, the album reached number 34 on the Billboard Pop Albums chart and featured the singles Another Saturday Night, The Title Track, and Good Times, which all went top 20 on the Billboard Pop Singles chart, as well as a cover of the country classic Tennessee Waltz, Irving Berlin's Sittin' in the Sun, and his most popular song, the civil rights anthem A Change Is Gonna Come. March of 1964 also saw the release of Glad All Over, the debut album by the Dave Clark Five. It spent 32 weeks on the Billboard 200 chart, peaking at number three, and features covers of Stay, made famous by the Zodiacs, and the Contour smash hit Do You Love Me, as well as his, their top 10 singles, Bits and Pieces, and the title track. Celebrating its 50th birthday this month is At Your Birthday Party, Steppenwolf's third album. It was their last album to feature guitarist Michael Monarch and the first to feature bassist Nick St. Nicholas. Although the band would continue for many more years, this was their last top 10 album, peaking at number 7 on the Billboard 200 charts, and the single Rock Me would be their last top 10 single at number 10. Another single from the album, It's Never Too Late, reached number 51 on the charts. Five decades ago this month also saw the release of Dusty in Memphis, Dusty Springfield's fifth album. Although it did feature a UK top 10 single in Son of a Preacher Man, the album was a commercial failure when it was released, only reaching number 99 on the Billboard 200 charts and not charting at all in Springfield's native UK. But the album did eventually achieve something of a legendary status. Rolling Stone ranked it number 89 on their list of the 500 greatest albums of all time, and NME named it the 54th greatest album ever. Also, the album received a Grammy Hall of Fame award in 2001. 45 years ago this month, ABBA released Waterloo, their sophomore album, but their first album released internationally. The title track became a worldwide hit after winning the 1974 Eurovision Song Contest, and it was also a top 10 hit in the US, Canada, the UK, and Norway. Oddly though, the album only reached number 49 in their native Sweden, and number 145 on the Billboard 200, but it was number 1 in Norway, and also top 10 in Germany. The album also featured the single Honey Honey, which was a top 40 hit in the US and Canada, and fan favorites My Mama Said and Hasta Manana. Also released in March of 1974 was the self-titled debut album by Canadian prog rock band Rush. It peaked at number 105 on the Billboard 200 charts, but has since earned gold certification in both the US and the band's native Canada. Core members Geddy Lee and Alex Lifeson wouldn't welcome drummer Neil Peart into the fold until their next album. Original drummer John Rutsey was on the kit for this album. Singles included Finding My Way and In the Mood. 
Four decades ago this month, Supertramp released their sixth album, Breakfast in America. It was their biggest selling album, sitting at number one on the Billboard Pop Albums chart for six weeks and earning quadruple platinum status in the US. It also topped the charts in Canada, France, Australia, and Norway. The album won Grammys for Best Recording Package and Best Engineered Album Non-Classical, and scored a nomination for Album of the Year. Three of its singles went top 20 in the US, The Logical Song, Goodbye Stranger, and Take the Long Way Home. And this album gave the band their only two top 10 singles in the UK, the title track and the logical song. By the way, the waitress on the front cover is actress Kate Murtaugh, who appeared on TV shows such as The Munsters, Highway to Heaven, and Three's Company, and in films including Breakfast at Tiffany's. Also released in March of 1979 was Go West, the Village People's fourth album. It peaked at number 8 on the Billboard 200 and earned a platinum certification within a month of release. The album went top 10 in 10 other countries, including Iceland and Zimbabwe. Go ahead, look it up. It featured the hit single In the Navy, which reached number 3 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 2 in the UK, and the title track, which only reached number 45 on the Billboard Hot 100, but went top 20 in the UK, Ireland, and Belgium. The Pet Shop Boys' cover of that song in 1993 went top 10 in over 15 countries, including number 1 in Ireland, Finland, and Germany. Happy 35th anniversary this month to Out of the Cellar, the debut album by metal band Rat. It was their most successful, peaking at number 7 on the Billboard 200 and number 12 in Canada. It featured the band's biggest hit, the number 12 ranked Billboard Hot 100 single Round and Round, and Wanted Man, both of whose videos received heavy rotation on MTV, along with Lack of Communication and Back for More. Round and Round and the album track I'm Insane were featured in the 2008 movie The Wrestler. Incidentally, the model on the album cover is actress Tawny Kittane, who had roles in the horror film Witchboard and the Tom Hanks comedy Bachelor Party, and also appeared in TV shows such as Seinfeld, Hercules' The Legendary Journeys, and Married with Children. Another debut album released in March of 1984 was Howard Jones' Humans Lib. It entered the UK album's chart at number one and stayed on the chart for 57 weeks, eventually being certified double platinum in the UK. It went top 20 in seven other countries, but only reached number 59 in the US. All four of the album's singles went top 20 in the UK. New Song and What Is Love went top 10 there, and also top 40 in the US, as well as Hide and Seek and Pearl in the Shell. Those were the album's other two singles. Three decades ago this month, Bonnie Raitt released her 10th album, Nick of Time. It was her first on Capitol Records and her first with producer Don Was. The album topped the Billboard 200 charts for three weeks out of its 185 weeks on the chart, and eventually was certified five times platinum. It scored her Grammys for Album of the Year, Pop Vocal Performance, and Rock Vocal Performance, and Rolling Stone ranked it at number 230 on their 500 Greatest Albums of All Time list. Singles included the title track and Have a Heart, both of which went top 10 on the Billboard Adult Contemporary charts, and Thing Called Love. The album track I Ain't Gonna Let You Break My Heart Again features Herbie Hancock on piano, and Cry On My Shoulder features David Crosby and Graham Nash on backing vocals. Also released in March of 1989 was Millie Vanilli's album Girl You Know It's True. It was a smash success. Out of its total 78 weeks on the Billboard 200 charts, it spent 41 of them in the top 10 and 7 weeks at number 1. It spawned 5 top 10 singles, 3 of which hit number 1, Baby Don't Forget My Number, Blame It on the Rain, and Girl I'm Gonna Miss You. The title track peaked at number two. Fabrice Morvan and Rob Pilatus received a Grammy for Best New Artist, which was rescinded by the Academy a year and a half later when news broke that neither of them sang a single note on the album. Arista canceled plans for a follow-up and deleted the album from their roster, making it one of the most successful albums to go out of print and the first time ever that a Grammy award was revoked. A quarter of a century ago, Soundgarden released their fourth album, Super Unknown. It debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 and spent 80 weeks on the chart. It was the 13th best-selling album of 1994, and also the band's most successful album. It eventually got certified five times platinum. The album also hit number one on the Australian, Canadian, and New Zealand charts. The band scored a Grammy nomination for Best Rock Album, and two singles also won Grammys. Black Hole Sun won Best Hard Rock Performance, and Spoon Man won Best Metal Performance. All five of the album's singles landed in the top 20 of the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart. Amongst them, Black Hole Sun hit number one, Spoonman hit number three, and Fell on Black Days hit number four. Also released in March of 1994 was Yanni's Live at the Acropolis. The concert took two and a half years to organize and was funded by Yanni himself at a cost of $2 million. 
It took place at the Herodes Atticus Theater in Athens, Greece, alongside the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, and Yanni mixed and produced the album in his own studio. The album peaked at number 5 on the Billboard 200 chart, and in six months was certified triple platinum. The concert was also filmed for a PBS TV special, which earned an Emmy nomination for Outstanding Lighting Direction. Happy 20th anniversary this month to Silverchair's third album, Neon Ballroom. It topped the album chart in the band's native Australia, it went top 10 in New Zealand and Canada, and peaked at number 50 on the Billboard 200. It was eventually certified quadruple platinum in Australia and gold in the US. Anna's song, Open Fire, reached number 12 on the Billboard Hot Modern Rock Tracks chart and top 20 in Australia, and dealt with frontman Daniel John's battles with anorexia. The album produced two other Australian top 20 singles, Anthem for the Year 2000 and Miss You Love. Also released in March of 1999 was Joey McIntyre's solo debut album, Stay the Same. It reached number 49 on the Billboard 200 and was certified gold. The single, Stay the Same, peaked at number 10 on the Billboard Hot 100, and follow-up single, I Love You Came Too Late, reached number 53. Fellow New Kids on the Block bandmates Donnie Wahlberg and Danny Wood shared songwriting credits on two songs each. Fifteen years ago this month, Los Lonely Boys released their self-titled debut album. It peaked at number 7 on the Billboard 200 chart and was certified double platinum after one year. Singles included Real Emotions, More Than Love, and Heaven, which reached number 1 on the adult contemporary charts and number 16 on the Billboard Hot 100, and was featured in video games such as Karaoke Revolution Presents American Idol and Guitar Hero on Tour. Willie Nelson performed acoustic guitar on the closing track La Contestación. Also released in March of 2004 was Jim's debut album Finally Woken. It peaked at number 6 on the UK charts, number 15 on the Irish charts, and number 197 on the Billboard 200. Single They topped the chart in Hungary and reached number 6 in the UK. Just a Ride hit number 16 in both Hungary and the UK. And Wish I made the top 40 in the UK. All three singles were heard in several TV shows including Grey's Anatomy and The O.C. and in movies such as Monster-in-Law and The Prince and Me. In March of 2009, Diana Krall released her 10th album, Quiet Nights. It went top 5 in most of Europe, peaked at number 2 in Canada and New Zealand, and number 3 on the Billboard 200, and was her ninth number 1 album on the Billboard Top Jazz Albums chart. The title track, an English version of Antonio Carlos Jobim's classic Corcovado, earned the arranger Klaus Ogerman a Grammy for Best Instrumental Arrangement Accompanying a Vocalist. The album included two other Jobim songs, including Boy From Ipanema, as well as the Backrack David tune Walk On By, the Rogers and Hart classic Where or When, and the Sammy Kahn Jewel Stein song Guess I'll Hang My Tears Out to Dry. Also released 10 years ago this month was No Line on the Horizon, U2's 12th album. It was produced by Brian Eno, Daniel Lenoir, and Steve Lillywhite, and was the band's first album in five years, their longest gap between albums until that point. It debuted at the top of the charts in 30 countries, including the US, Canada, Australia, and most of Europe. It also set a record in Brazil by earning a platinum certification just one week after release there. It received a Grammy nomination for Best Rock Album, and Rolling Stone named it the Best Album of the Year. The single Get On Your Boots was a number one hit in Ireland, and a top five hit in Canada and the Netherlands, and it also went top 40 in the US. Magnificent went top 10 in Ireland, Canada, and the Netherlands, and their third single, I'll Go Crazy If I Don't Go Crazy Tonight, got two Grammy nominations for Best Rock Song and Best Rock Performance by a duo or group with vocals. Happy 5th anniversary this month to Foster the People's sophomore album, Supermodel. It was the follow-up to their debut album, Torches, but it peaked higher, number 3 on the Billboard 200, whereas Torches peaked at number 8. It also went top 10 in Canada and Australia, and top 20 in Poland and New Zealand. Its lyrics dealt with the unsavory aspects of capitalism, consumerism, and self-worth in the social media age. Lead-off single Coming of Age peaked at number 4 on the Billboard Alternative Songs chart and number 14 on the Billboard Hot Rock Songs chart. Single Best Friend reached number 15 and number 21 respectively on the same charts. Other singles Pseudologica Fantastica and Are You What You Want To Be made the top 50 on the Hot Rock Songs chart. Also released in March of 2014 was Pharrell Williams' sophomore album Girl. It was released 8 years after his debut and it peaked at number 2 on the Billboard 200. It also went top 10 in 28 other countries, topping the charts in 12 of them. The album boasts appearances by Alicia Keys, Justin Timberlake, Kelly Osbourne, Miley Cyrus, and Daft Punk, reciprocating his appearance the previous year on Daft Punk's Random Access Memories. 
The album won a Grammy nomination for Album of the Year and a win for Best Urban Contemporary Album. The smash hit single Happy from the, mov the movie Despicable Me 2 soundtrack received an Oscar nomination for Best Original Song and it topped the singles charts in 24 countries. And now it is time for the Spotlight Albums of the Month. That's right, another month with two Spotlight Albums. Pleased to say I am keeping with my New Year's resolution of having more two-album Backtrack Spotlight Months, uh, so far anyway. We'll see how that goes for the rest of the year. Uh, and these two are very different albums, I'll, I'll warn you right now. I'm, I'm trying to, uh, you know, stretch out in as many different genre directions as I possibly can. Uh, this first album is 55 years old this month. It was released in March of 1964. It is Getz Gilberto by American saxophonist Stan Getz and Brazilian guitarist Joao Gilberto. Uh, composer of most of the tracks, Antonio Carlos Jobim is featured on piano through most of these songs. And also Gilberto's then-wife Astrid also sang on two songs, Corcovado and Garota de Ipanema, which won Grammy for Record of the Year, by the way, uh, Girl from Ipanema. Uh, the album actually won several Grammys, Best Jazz Instrumental Album, the Best Engineered Recording Non-Classical, and Album of the Year. And it was the only jazz album to win Album of the Year until Herbie Hancock's River the Joni Letters 43 years later. Interesting trivia note there for you. Oh, and also it's listed at number 447 on Rolling Stone's Greatest Albums of All Time list. And, okay, now that the uh, dry facts are out of the way, this is an absolutely beautiful album. <sighs> If you can picture the album equivalent of taking a bubble bath, this is it. I've heard for a long time that listening to albums in the evening, like while you're unwinding, getting ready for bed, helps relax you, helps you sleep better. Although, as much as I love music, I've never tried that. But I tried it with this album, and oh, it worked like a charm. Uh, it is just, it, and not to say that that's an album that'll put you to sleep, because it's not. It's just. It is just absolutely beautiful. It's good to listen to any time of the, of the day or night. Just, I don't know that I've ever heard a jazz album that sounds so intimate. It's almost like, you know, with Stan Getz's saxophone particularly, it's almost like he's leaning in, playing for you like that, you know, leaning into the microphone. It's just, it's just beautiful. The songs are gorgeous, uh, wonderfully played, and it's just, as I said, it's just such a relaxing and wonderful album. It's, a, it's like getting a massage in a spa or something. I cannot recommend this album highly enough, uh, especially if you've got, you know, a stressful job or, you know, something that stresses you out during the day and you need something that'll just help you relax, help you unwind, you know, in the hour or two before bedtime particularly, or, you know, as I said, in any other circumstance you need to just de-stress, put this album on. You cannot go wrong. Uh, so, as if I couldn't uh, stop uh, recommending this album enough, as I said, it's fantastic. One of my best experiences uh, listening to an album, any album at all, so far. It's just, I knew it was going to be good, but I had no idea it was going to have that effect on me. It's just so beautiful and so relaxing. I can't even point out any individual tracks. They're all just so good. Uh, I mean, some of them we all know. Girl from Ipanema and uh, Corcovado even is, it's a bit of a lesser standard, but it's pretty much recognizable. But, uh, yeah, oh, and uh, Desafinado, that's also another good one. So, yeah, as, as I said probably several times by now, check that album out. You can't go wrong. Uh, my other Spotlight album of the month, however, is a complete departure from Getz Gilberto. It's about as far away from them as you can get in terms of uh, genre or type of music or, or mood. It is Frank Zappa's album, Shake Your Booty. Yeah, Shake Your Booty, get it? Uh, it is uh, 40 years old this month. It was released in March of 1979. It was his first album released on his own label, Zappa Records, after parting ways with Warner Brothers. It also happens to be his best-selling album, and it is a double album, by the way, two LPs. And it was mostly recorded live, but it employed lots of overdubs uh, and stuff, so many overdubs, it, that it didn't sound like a live album. And there was actually no crowd noise at all until the end of the final track. Now, I've always thought of uh, Frank Zappa. This is, by the way, the first full album of Frank Zappa's that I've ever listened to. And he's always struck me as kind of the same way with uh, David Bowie, in a sense that he's just got has such a reputation and is such a sophisticated, I guess you'd say, or, you know, in a league of his own artist, that the idea of listening to a full album of his intimidated me. 
but uh, as with also as with David Bowie, I'm glad I dipped into it. Uh, this is just this is a crazy album. I got to tell you, it's if you can imagine a roller coaster ride of recorded sound. This is it. I mean, you just, you just kind of don't know where it's going to go from one from one minute to the next. Uh, he employs so many different genres, sometimes several genres within each song. And uh, if you've never listened to this album or any other Frank Zappa album all the way through, here's what I recommend. Uh, Weird Al did a song called Genius in France on one of his uh, albums, it was several albums ago, and it was what he calls a style parody of Frank Zappa. And now, uh, in Al's terms, a style parody is not a parody of a particular song, just a song done in the style of a certain artist. And that was, after listening to this album, Genius in France is an absolute spot-on style parody of Frank Zappa. So I would recommend going listen to that song a few times. And then if you if you like what you hear, if it's, you know, just kind of has you curious enough, then check out an album. And honestly, I would recommend this album right here. It's a little long, as I said, so... You know, if that maybe intimidates you, pick a shorter album. But honestly, this album is over before you know it, really. Um, the tracks run together, uh, many of the tracks run together and include some interludes of, with just rapid fire, random clips, uh, just kind of, you know, stitched in between each of the songs. So it's like each side of the album is over before, over before you know it. And as I said, the number of genres that he covers throughout this album, it just boggles the mind. There's a song on here called, uh, forgive the title, Broken Hearts Are For Assholes. That one reminds me very much of early metal, like ACDC particularly. And then the uh, final track on the album, which I mentioned a minute ago, called Yo Mama, is a 12 and a half minute track. And that is just full on late 70s prog. So, I mean, if you love prog, uh, Sam Bennett, you love prog music, check out Frank Zappa's song Yo Mama. It's just amazing. Now, I mentioned Weird Al a few minutes ago. Uh, there is an important distinction to make between Weird Al and Frank Zappa. Uh, Al's humor was decidedly and deliberately much more family friendly because Al obviously wants to appeal to the widest age group possible for his uh, his audience. Frank Zappa, on the other hand, yeah, his humor is it's more sophisticated. It's uh, got a lot more satire in it. And it's in some places it's it's more adult. Uh, there's there are more sexual references, uh, particularly in the song uh, Bobby Brown, which which by the way is not about the R and B singer. I mean you know, the real Bobby Brown was what eight or nine years old when this album came out. Uh, yeah, fictitious Bobby Brown. Uh, and also there's a song called I Have Been in You. That's, that's a uh, suggestive enough title right there. And that I think is a takeoff on a Peter Frampton song, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, but yeah, you know, those albums employ some possibly sexist jokes, uh, some homophobic references, possibly. But a couple things that I forgive those songs for. I mean, first of all, it this is kind of an artifact of its time. This album is forty years old. Uh, you know, some humor standards were different back then. But also, uh, Frank Zappa, from what I understand, uh, in his personal life, was very liberal. Uh, you know, in his in his viewpoints and whatnot, and so the sexual references and stuff in the songs was more his stage persona. You know, he he didn't set out to shock people just, just for shock's sake, but he, w he did want to... I think a lot of his songs, he just wanted to raise people's eyebrows, maybe just to, to just slightly ruffle some feathers. So, you know, that's the things to keep in mind when listening to this album, is, you know, to not take things terribly personally. I didn't when I listened to this album. Uh, and there's another song called Jewish Princess that uh, it drew some criticism from the Anti-Defamation League because it did employ some Jewish stereotypes. Uh, but then, you know, Weird Al did a song uh, that poked fun at, at uh, Jewish people and nobody seemed to mind that. So, anyway, that's a matter of opinion, honestly. Uh, but anyway, back to the uh, the less offensive songs, and there are plenty of those. Um, I first heard the song Dance and Fool on a singles collection. I have a singles collection in my CDs. Uh, CD library, and that's kind of a, a parody on the disco, the disco craze of the late 70s, and that's a fun song. That's a really fun song, and another one that I really, really got a kick out of was called Baby Snakes, and uh, it's just it's just a silly, funny song, and but aside from the lyrical content, the instrumentation on this album is astonishing, flat out amazing, uh, particularly on side two. There are actually several instrumental songs uh, in between 
you know, the what stuff on that side is vocal. Uh, there's a song called Ret Tamago or Tamago. I was, <laughs> you say Tamago, I say Tamago. I, I don't know how you pronounce it, but uh, that one and Shake the Shake Your Booty Tango. And those are both actually excerpts of tracks from previously released songs on previous Zappa albums. But those songs really show off Frank Zappa's guitar skills. I mean, if you listen to this album and come away not thinking that Zappa is up there with Clapton and Carlos Santana and Mark Knopfler uh, on guitar acumen, guitar skills, then uh, there's something wrong with your hearing. I mean, go check, get your hearing checked, honestly. But yeah, it's it just it just left me. I think I think my jaw actually dropped in some places listening to Frank Zappa's guitar works. But the only thing I hated about those two songs was that they ended so abruptly. And yeah, they they were you know as I said they were excerpts from uh, previously released songs. So uh, yeah, it was a little bit jarring to have them just end like that. So but it is making me want to seek out the albums with the original versions of those tracks on them. So but yeah, altogether. This was an amazing listen. This quite possibly, even including last year's Spotlight albums, this may be my favorite uh, Spotlight album experience so far. It was just, you know, it was amazing. I mean, Frank Zappa is not going to be for everyone. You know, if you like to have your stuff, you know, uniform and easy to listen to, and, you know, something that maintains its own genre, its own rhythm, its own tempo and stuff, then Frank Zappa is not for you. But if you're just willing to let your expectations go by the wayside and just put aside all rules for music composition and music theory and listen to Frank Zappa, I think you'll be rewarded, honestly. It's, 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 it's an adventure listening to him. He's kind of, the laws of normal music don't apply with Frank Zappa, let's put it that way. Uh, but yeah, I would highly recommend that and it is definitely going to make me uh, seek out more of his stuff. So yeah, I could go on forever, but suffice to say, two fantastic experiences with Backtrack Spotlight albums this month. Uh, it is one of my favorite features. I mean, Bargain Bag is a little bit more of a favorite of mine, but I still, I just, you know, the experiences I've had with these albums uh, in Backtracks so far on my channel have just been amazing. So anyway, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I appreciate feedback, whether about this video or anything on my channel or about music in general. I'd love to hear from you in the comments section below. I invite you to subscribe to my channel as well and check out my past videos to see what you might have missed. I'm also on Twitter, and you can find the link to my Twitter feed in the description below, so check it out and follow along. Also, please take the time to visit my friends and fellow YouTubers channels, which are also linked to in the description below. They're all great at what they do, and they're very much worth your attention. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.